Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight in learning about handwriting. Um, our Hatchery Health Clinic is going to be presenting on that topic. So I'm excited to learn more about that with you all. Um, just as a reminder, this video presentation is going to be recorded. So if you would like to keep your cameras on, that is your choice. Uh, we do ask if you can put your microphones on mute. There is time for um, a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them at the end of the presentation. And with that being said, um, I can hand over the presentation to the Hatchery Hill Clinic. I'll, I'll start since I'm doing a lot of the, the beginning things. Um, so we are the staff from Hatchery Hill. My name is Catherine Record. I am one of the occupational therapists here. Um, also presenting tonight, we have Asha Frederick, who all other speech language pathologists, um, Nora Garrity and Rose Heckenkamp Bush. Um, yeah, again, if you have any questions, let us know. And again, it's recorded. And yeah, okay, cool. So tonight we're gonna be going over um, some handwriting development, um, the physical and environmental considerations for handwriting. Um, and then our SLPs will be going into more of the written communication side of things. Okay, so we will start with um, pre-writing development. So if you have younger kids or even some older kids who are really working on those basics of handwriting, um, this is what we as occupational therapists start with and schools start with as well. Um, so a major component of pre-writing skills are the pre-writing shapes that you see to the right. Um, so like the vertical line, horizontal line, circle plus square, so on and so forth. Um, so these are the pencil strokes that most of our letters and numbers and early drawings are comprised of. Um, so you just look at these, like the first two, like the vertical line and a horizontal line, that makes an L. Um, so really all of our things are comprised of these shapes or these motor patterns that we would do while writing. Um, Typically, these are mastered in sequential order. So you can see each of the lines have a year um, that goes along with it. So by two, year, two years old, we should have mastered the uh, or, or vertical line and again, so on and so forth. Um, and then along with this also comes developing a functional grasp, um, which I'll get into a little bit in a couple slides from now. Um, So then after you master those pre-writing shapes, you can then work on actual handwriting uh, development for letters, numbers, all those fun things. Um, so between the ages of five and six, once those kids have mastered the pre-writing shapes, they're ready to begin learning how to write the letters of the alphabet. Um, there's a lot of research out there that indicates that kids should learn uppercase letters first and then lowercase letters and then numbers. Um, this just goes along again with just the developmental sequence of what's going to be easiest to learn um, and allow them to have success as they're learning before they, they move on to the harder things. Um, there's some debate about what exact sequence works the best, but what you see to the right is typically what um, we do first. So generally the letters with vertical and horizontal lines, like I said, L, F, E, H, T, I, um, are the easiest because those are the, it's comprised of the lines that they mastered when they were potentially two, two and a half years old. Um, and then as you move on, um, 
you get to the letters with the curves and diagonals, which are uh, skills that come later. Um, so again, to the right kind of shows you the sequence. So I'll, I think a lot of people think, oh, we're learning writing our alphabet. Let's start with A. But A is actually one of the harder letters. So thinking about um, the developmental sequence is important to provide success for the kids as they are learning their letters. Um, so then, like I said, going into the pencil grasp, um, this is something as OTs we work a lot on. Um, there's very commonly um, goals surrounding grasp, especially with handwriting. Um, but it's kind of interesting because studies show that use of a dynamic tripod grasp, which is those three finger grasp, um, a quadrupod grasp, which is using four fingers, no pinky, um, a lateral tripod grasp or a lateral quadrupod grasp does not affect legibility. So even though the kind of golden standard is that dynamic tripod grasp, um, a lot of grasps can still be functional. Um, but where we run into challenges are when there's more immature grasps, um, <clears throat> such as like the uh, picture top right, the digital pronate grasp, if they're writing like kind of upside down and backwards, then that can be really tricky to get those lines um, the, to be legible and be able to read whatever they're writing. Um, and then some more physical considerations, um, as the kiddos are writing, they should be stabilizing the writing paper with their non-dominant hand. That allows for stability, because um, if you're starting to write and the paper starts to move, that's always going to affect legibility. Um, their arm and wrists should be resting on the table so that they're fully supported as they're writing. Um, and then also to take into consideration is if adapted writing supplies is needed, what will help them be the most successful? So is it a adapted writing utensil, um, adding different grips to the pencil? Um, there's paper that has like raised lines on it so that they can understand where the top of the paper is and where the bottom is on the writing line. Um, you can also have paper that has highlighted lines like, um, there's so much different adapted paper out there. I'm sure your occupational therapist can um, give a lot of great suggestions for that. Um, and then also to take into consideration is like if modifications to the desk are needed, um, if they need to be, I guess this goes into the next slide too about environmental considerations, but um, there's so much that goes into handwriting. There's a lot that can be adapted to allow kids to be more successful with the actual physical component of it. And then, so for environmental considerations, um, when you think about a classroom, I typically think of a kind of loud, distracting place um, that when you're working on handwriting, if there's a kiddo that maybe has sensory processing differences or really any focus challenges. There can be a lot of visual and auditory distractions. There's a lot of great resources in classrooms. Um, for instance, like the bright, colorful things that teach us about different numbers or about the letters. Like you have the alphabet going across the top of the classroom. Um, but sometimes those can be distracting for kids and then they'll be less focused on the handwriting. Um, or if there's a lot of kids talking, then that can be distracting and then that can impact the legibility of the handwriting as well. Um, if there's poor lighting in the classroom or even those really bright fluorescent lights can be um, challenging for kids. Um, like I said, with the modifications to a desk, um, this picture to the right shows how we should be sitting at our desks. Um, <clears throat> so if kids are at a desk that is way too big for them, which sometimes happens, especially in like kindergarten and first grade when the kids are still pretty little. If they're at a really giant desk that's way too high for them and they're trying to write, but they're, it's like way too high, then that's gonna um, make it really challenging for them to do that. Um, or if their feet are not touching the ground, then that can be a decreased stability. And then they're focused more on their like core stability and focus on just trying to sit up straight while not having their feet touching the ground. 
that can impact legibility, um, the type of paper that we have. So if there's lines on the paper versus asking a kid to write on like a piece of construction paper, that's more challenging than if there are lines. So what adaptions can you make um, to like crafts that have just construction paper? Can you draw lines in for the kid? Um, can you make a baseline? Um, and then, like I said before, like the distance of the desk from the board that they're copying from. So if a um, kid would benefit from having that near point copy where they're really close and can just write it right from the board to their paper, that can be helpful. Or if they're having vision challenges, um, distance from where they're copying from is another consideration. And then kind of what I said before, the 90-90-90 position. So seated at the desk, um, with their hips, knees, and ankles all at the 90 degree uh, angle will help keep them stabilized and having that table squarely in front of them, not too high, not too low, um, can help with developing good handwriting. And the last slide for me <laughs> um, is making it functional. That is the best part of an OT's job is making things fun and functional. Um, so it's not that we're just sitting there writing our alphabet a billion times. Um, so kids respond really well to writing activities that are presented as part of another activity or an activity that holds meaning to them. Um, so I know I've done so many handwriting activities about Minecraft because that is very motivating for a lot of my kids. Um, so instead of just writing the alphabet, we're writing like we're doing a code uh, discovery thing with Minecraft characters, um, or we're doing a, a scavenger hunt around the sensory gym to find letters so that they're also moving around. Um, so the next part of it goes into like sensory motor activities. So doing the gross motor activity of doing that scavenger hunt, finding the letters, matching, um, making those letters with their bodies or doing alphabet yoga, uh, things like that. Um, doing fine motor or messy play. So I feel like you see those a lot on like any Pinterest board is, you know, using the shaving cream and writing your letters in that or writing in sand, um, using Play-Doh to physically make the letters as they're learning how to make those. Um, yeah, using, yeah, different gross motor games. Um, and having fun and being creative and the more stimuli that we can use to convey the concepts, the better. So you might think that just that rote practice of writing the letters um, will be the most beneficial, but actually incorporating all of these concepts into really fun tasks is what's gonna make it stick for the kids. So yeah, making letters out of anything in the world um, is super fun, super functional and helps um, make handwriting something that's not just this boring, let me sit at my desk and write sort of thing. That's all that. Hi, I'm Asha. Um, I'm an SLP and as an SLP, when I think about handwriting, I think about its role in written communication. Um, so, written communication could involve handwriting that would be things like writing narratives or stories writing someone a letter or a note um writing in a journal um or it could be um, through technology like sending an email or a text message um and so some things that as slps we consider with written communication and communication overall would be um, a kiddo's receptive language skills. So their ability to understand um, language, like following directions and answering questions, um, their expressive language skills. So using communication and language to get their wants and needs met. And then um, some liter literacy skills would be really important in written communication. Maybe things like grammar or sentence structure, um, yeah, I think that that covers it.
Hi, sorry, I was on mute. Um, hi, my name is Rose. I'm going to take over for this next part here. Um, and I'm also a speech pathologist here at the Hatchery Hill Clinic. Um, and when we were talking about doing handwriting, the first thing that came to my mind is that um, I use handwriting all the time, but as a way to help me teach what we call letter sound correspondence. Um, and that I think is just a fancy way of saying, teach the sound that a letter makes. Um, so you would think generally that that's not very hard to do, but there are 26 letters in our alphabet, but those letters and combinations of letters make about 44 distinct sounds. Um, and depending on the combinations you put them in can um, sometimes be very difficult to pronounce. So um, we often think in speech therapy about the way kids make sounds. So a common one you might think of is um, my kid can't say the letter S or my kid can't say the letter R. And, um, you know, to teach that effectively, normally I, I think to myself, well, I can't just use one way of teaching them this sound. I can't rely on the kid hearing it correctly because um, if that was going to work, they wouldn't be in speech therapy. So um, what I do is um, using what I call a multimodal or multi-sensory approach. So what that means is I use lots of methods to teach basically the same thing through the five senses. Um, so some of the ideas that Catherine said earlier about the really fun uh, functional sensory ways of playing and learning letters is a great way to start. Um, for today's purposes, I'm going to focus more on, you know, using like seeing, uh, seeing, touching, smell, not smelling, but um, hearing, and then I'm going to leave, leave taste out of the uh, equation for now. So hopefully if you want to do some play therapy with food, that's, that's on you parents. But um, generally, if I teach kids uh, how to, we're going to work on a sound, um, we use our eyes by looking at the paper, we see the letter on the paper, um, they can see my mouth moving. Um, Pre-COVID, uh, that was a lot easier. Now you might see us wearing these really cool masks that you can see our mouth through so that they can actually see us forming the shape we want. Um, we use our ears because they let me, they hear me explain how to make the sound. They hear me make the sound, and then I'm asking them to hear themselves make the sound as well. Um, but the last way I think about teaching is uh, through touch or movement. So that's kind of where the handwriting piece comes in. So if they're holding a pencil and putting it to paper, as they're making that letter, they're getting a lot of um, tactile or kinesthetic feedback into their body and into their brain. And that's another way that they can make an association with that letter that we might be working on. Um, and so if I put all of those ways together, it helps me teach them what it is that we're trying to do. So I'm not just saying, okay, we're gonna make our S sound. I have a lot of the kids actually make the letter S with me. And then we, you know, we might draw pictures with it and we might um, try to think of words that, that go with that letter. And then um, that really helps us isolate what we're looking for. So that letter can come at the beginning, the middle or the end of the word. And if they don't know the letter itself, how are they gonna learn how to say it when they're speaking? So um, yeah, there are also a lot of applications with helping children um, use letter sound correspondence in other ways. So obviously I'm using it in perhaps articulation therapy or sound speech sounds with kids, but um, there's also a lot of ways you can apply this to helping kids learn to read. So we're very familiar with the idea of phonics and um, you know, helping them decode what a, a word looks like on paper. So you make it each individual sound and then first you do them separately and then you learn eventually how to blend them together. So that is how I use um, I use handwriting as an SLP. Hi, I'm Nora. Um, another thing to consider is the organization of writing. So when we write, we need to generate ideas, but then we also need to present them in a logical way. 
Um, and with the strong connection between spoken language and written language, we can first help kids learn to speak and organize ways um, to support their ability to, to write and organize ways too. Um, so here are a couple ways that we can do that. We can help kids practice retelling experiences. So if you do a few activities during the day, um, practicing retelling those activities in the correct sequence, um, we can also retell stories. So after you read a book, encouraging kids to retell the story is a really powerful way to build narrative skills. And we can also use graphic organizers to support writing and to support the planning process for writing. So on the next slide, there are a few examples of different graphic organizers um, that we can use. Um, these don't have to be anything fancy. It could be something that you're um, jotting down on a piece of paper to help kids plan their writing and to um, organize their, their thinking. All right, so if that is all all of our Hatchery Hill therapists have for us, I was going to open up the presentation to any questions that any parents might have about the information that we uh, went over on um, this presentation. And I know that sometimes with um, some of these presentations, some questions might pop up um, later on. So if you ever have a question, you can always email your individual therapist that's, that your child might see, or you can contact connect at citherapies.com and we can hopefully uh, guide you to someone that will be able to answer that question. Um, in addition, if you are not able to um, either see the beginning of our presentation or if you would like to go back and watch it again, all of our CI Connect parent caregiver trainings are located on our website for um, a later viewing if you would like. But um, thank you so much Hatchery Hill for giving this great presentation. I know I learned a lot and I'm very thankful that you all were able to um, give the presentation tonight. So with that being said, I hope you all have a great night. Um, thank you very much. Bye, everyone.